Good evening, church. It is Wednesday, July the 8th. As you can see, I am not at home, and I don't have a panel of friends with me to do our online Bible study the way that we typically would uh, during this time. Instead, we have a special midweek worship service uh, for you and a message that comes to us from our bishop, Bill McAlilly. A couple of things I do want to share with you before we hear from Bishop McAlilly. Uh, first is that uh, we will return next week, July the 15th, with our normal Wednesday night online Bible study. I'll have a new panel of individuals. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some, some topics that come up from July 12th worship service and uh, July the 11th we will be having a Netflix party so that's this upcoming Saturday night uh, we're going to be watching Disney's Christopher Robin and then on the 12th I'm going to be joined by a panel where we're going to be talking about Sabbath rest and abiding in God and and actually that's part of the reason why we're coming to you with a special midweek service uh, is so that I can get some Sabbath rest this summer uh, and that uh, the, those who I, I typically call upon to help me with our online Bible study might be able to to have a rest in the middle of the week this week as well. But we are so glad that the bishop is sharing us uh, this message from Jeremiah uh, tonight. Uh, one more thing I want to share with you, and it relates to Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, and it's in regards to uh, the way that we've been doing Sunday morning worship, the format that we use, and uh, how that's connecting with you. So, we want to hear your input. We want you to take a survey. It's going to only take two minutes, and you can find that survey at peacetree.church slash survey. Again, that's peacetree.church slash survey. I also have a QR code that's up on the screen. If you've got your smartphone close by, open up the camera app, scan this. It'll give you a prompt to go to that website and to take the survey online. But let us know, uh, what have you thought about our summer movie series? Uh, would you like us to go in a different direction with our worship services on Sunday? How often do you tune in on Wednesday nights for our Bible studies? We want to hear from you. We want your input. Uh, and again, we will be back to normal on July the 15th with a new panel, and you'll see me back at home. Uh, but I'm taking a rest this week. I'm getting to enjoy some Sabbath. We're going to talk about Sabbath on the 12th after our Netflix party with Christopher Robin on the 11th. But right now, we invite you to hear a word from Bishop McAlilly about Jeremiah, about growing deep with God, about loving our neighbors, uh, even as the world is so divided, even as we're all uh, stuck at home and staying safe at home. Uh, he provides a word of hope. And I hope that you'll stay with us after his message uh, because I'll have a little bit more to add and we'll also have a special song from our worship team. But now let us enjoy this word together from Bishop McAlilly. Good morning. It's my joy to come to you this uh, in this very unusual season, in this very unusual way, virtually, to share with you a reading from Jeremiah's gospel and a message titled Growing Deep. Here the reading from Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning at the seventh verse. Happy are those who trust in the Lord, who rely on the Lord. They will be like trees planted by the streams whose roots reach down to the water. They won't fear drought when it comes. Their leaves will remain green. They won't be stressed in the time of drought or fail to bear fruit. The most cunning heart is beyond help. Who can figure it out? I, the Lord, probe the heart and discern hidden motives to give everyone what they deserve, their consequences of their deeds. Like a partridge gathering a brood that is not its own, so are those who require wealth corruptly. By midlife it will be gone. Afterward they will look like fools. Splendid and exalted the place of our sanctuary from the beginning. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will suffer disgrace. Those who turn away from you in the land will be written off. For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of the living water. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, I will be saved. For you are my heart's desire. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me now? O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter in every storm of life and our eternal home. We give thanks this day that we can gather for worship in a virtual way, and share this message. This morning I prayed for the congregations of the Tennessee and Memphis Conference. I 
pray that those who are sharing this time together will find a word of hope and healing and blessing. Speak to us now, Lord, and give us your strength. Let us be like a tree planted by the water whose roots grow deep. And now may those who are gathered today hear you and not me, see you and not me. And when we give thanks over this day, may you receive all the glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. For six years, I lived among the live oak trees on the Mississippi Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina devastated our coast. In fact, weekly, I would drive down Highway 90, which was known to the locals as the Beach Road, and I would marvel at the majesty of those live oak trees where there were hundreds, if not thousands, of those massive trees. They were massive in scope and scale. These majestic, massive, evergreen trees. Did you know live oak trees were among the evergreen trees? Who ever dreamed that that would be the case? A live oak tree is the dream of every child who ever wanted to build a tree house in a tree. Their leaves are long and low, and you can get climbing those trees forever if you had opportunity. If only I'd had a tree like that when I was a child in my yard, I would have been so pleased. One of the interesting things I learned while living there was amongst those massive trees was the reason that they were so strong, grew so tall, stretched so wide, and offered such great shade was that the root system was deep and wide. We know the central root system of any tree is the tap root, but in a live oak tree, it's called an anchor root. It literally anchors the tree deep, then grows wide with a root system that stretches around and around the tree, often four to seven times the diameter of that tree. Can you imagine a root system that massive? Unfortunately, after Hurricane Katrina, some of those massive live oak trees died. It's been almost 15 years since the storm. And yet one can still see the remnants of hundreds of those trees dying that died from the border of Louisiana to Alabama across the Mississippi Gulf Coast along the Beach Road. Some creative artists came along with a, a chainsaw and carved figurines out of the dead trees, turning a thing of death into a thing of life, a thing of beauty, a tourist attraction. I wondered if that might be a metaphor for where we see ourselves in the church today, some congregations deeply rooted, engaged in mission and faithful discipleship, and others once beautiful places of vibrant, vital communities, now artifacts, even close to museums. There are many causes of such decline in trees, too much water, lack of proper nutrients, too many storms, and congregations. Maybe it's an unwillingness to engage the neighborhood with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I ponder that question in this season I pray, Lord, are we rooted deeply enough in you that when the drought comes, when the storms comes, we will continue to bear fruit? Well, the roots of my faith and life come from places where water is plentiful and gray trees grow large and tall, roots grow deep and branch out. I've learned over time, however, that storms will stunt, heat will scorch, and fruit is sometimes scarce. Is it possible, is it possible that in this season of COVID-19 and the racial pandemic that we find ourselves in a season of drought? Well, along comes this word from Jeremiah who says, blessing comes when one's roots and one's life are trust, trusting in the Lord. Now, the Old Testament theology does not distinguish greatly between trust and faith. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not in thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. When Lynn and I were married, a friend gave us a needlepoint of those very words. One of the interesting things is that the day that we moved into the Episcopal Residence in Nashville, that very plaque, a plaque with those very same words, was resting on the desk in the Episcopal office. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not onto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will, he will direct thy paths. 
Seems like an easy thing to do just to trust, just to have faith. Well, Jeremiah did not have a great support group. He did not have a congregation around him that was cheering him on, encouraging him, saying, hang in there, don't give up, press on. I wonder if he had not been on his own, if he had a group around him, if he might have said things a bit differently, prophesied with less vim and vicar. Somebody would have talked him out of saying some of the harsh things that he said. But times were desperate. He was passionate. In fact, if you catch the first six verses of chapter 17, he wasn't doling out blessings, just curses, which these days, if you're paying attention, you understand quite well. I think about the agony, the lament, the pain of the families of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Philando Castile and others. In Jeremiah's time, there was turmoil and exile. Hearts were hardened. The enemy lurked just outside the gate. He longed for more for his people. He longed for them to be planted deeply in the Lord, to place their trust in God. He knew that if he could call on his people to a deeper life, a more faithful trust in God, when the hard times come, and they surely will come, as surely as I am speaking to you this morning, they will come. He knew that if he was grounded, if one was grounded deep in the heart of God, not one's own heart, but the heart of God. The dry seasons would come, but fruit would still be born. Like Jeremiah, we are in an awesome and definitive moment in the history of the church and the world. When Jeremiah comes on the scene, there was great anxiety in Jerusalem. In 587 B.C., the party's over. We're paying attention to our rhetoric and to our activity. We're caught in a similar place of anxiety in the midst of these dual pandemics of COVID-19 and racism that people who look like me have difficulty understanding. We wonder what will become of us, what will become of the world, what will become of the church. We ask, when when will people stop dying? We ask how many people have to die. When we think of COVID-19, we know, many of us know, persons who've had to die alone, loved ones, separated, by a wall or a door, exiled from the hospital room. And we grieve with those in our family who've lost loved ones. In the midst of all of the COVID pandemic, in the midst of all the racial strife in our world right now, we still have other issues that capture our attention. We worry about the unemployment rate in our country. We worry when the country will open up and our economy will return to normal. How long, O Lord, we pray, how long will this go on? When the physical and social distancing first began, I really had a hard time with the thought that I was going to have to stay home indefinitely. In fact, Lynn and I had a, quite a number of conversations about whether I could go out or whether I could play golf or where I, whether I could go to the grocery store. I joked, I said, well, she's got a, a leash around my neck with a 12-foot rope, and any time I get too far out, she just pulls me back in. I wondered how long this would go on. Well, here we are, three months later, worshiping virtually still some of us, seeking to be rooted in something deeper, something more profound than just what we know what we experience. Well, here Jeremiah is speaking. He's speaking in a time of great need for the people of God. And he steps on this stage of biblical history. He's rooted in the old memories of Moses, those deeply rooted faithful stories of Moses as they're mediated in the teaching of Deuteronomy. The covenant, the covenant was central to all that Jeremiah taught and all that he believed. The covenant's deep. It's demanding. It's intimate. It is intimate because it creates a relationship between us and God. Jeremiah's words must have been as shocking to the people who believe that you should only etch divine or good things on the heart. But the central passage of one of their central books in Deuteronomy provided as follows. Keep the words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Write them on your heart. Oh, in the church... We try to clarify our mission. 
We speak of making disciples of Jesus Christ, only to discover that we're one step forward and two step back. We get crossed up with one another because we differ theologically on how best to navigate this changing cultural landscape. Some of us feel called to be prophetic. Others of us feel called to hold attention so that we can uh, wait on God to reveal a solution. Others of us feel strongly that God has spoken. What are we to do? How shall we navigate this impasse? We agree to disagree. We bend our covenants. But do we deepen our roots in Christ and in one another? And here comes Jeremiah, a poet who is acutely sensitive to the pain and failure of his community. Window dressing was not going to address the problems Judas faced. And window dressing was not, would not be adequate for facing our differences in our context and beyond. And so Jeremiah sets out to tell a better story to help Israel live a better story, to reposition and reimagine a better future in terms of commitment to Christ or to God and reliance upon God between a blessing and a prayer, Jeremiah speaks. He says our trust in God draws us to trust in each other as rooted in God's hope and His love that we are called to exhibit. That's what it means to be a Methodist, to be rooted in God's hope and to love as the people call Methodist to trust in one another. Blessed is the one whose trust is in the Lord, says Jeremiah. Heal me, Lord. Heal me, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. One of the several that Jeremiah prays really is confession this prayer. He prays out of hurt. He prays out of grief. He prays out of anger and a sense of acute danger. He prays. I too am praying right now. In this cultural moment of divisiveness in this country, I pray, how shall we be the church? What is your heart's desire? How will we hold this tension between doing no harm and doing good? The constrictions of the human condition force us to acknowledge our ultimate powerlessness. Nothing, nothing is sufficient for us except God. And so we must risk to be a part of the story. We can trust in ourselves, our priorities, our strength, and become like a shrub in the desert with no relief, living in parched places of the wilderness. Or we can listen to Jeremiah, who calls us to place our trust in the Lord, who is the fountain of the living water. So that we're like a tree planted by the water, whose roots grow deep in loving God and loving what God loves. We often feel powerless up against this virus. A virus we cannot see in a world that's increasingly conflicted. But here's what we know. The only way out is through. And the way through is to surrender to God. I don't know about you, but for me, I get an A in control. For me, it's incredibly difficult, this notion of surrendering. Every day I wake up and pray, Lord, today I will surrender. But by lunchtime, I'm large and in charge again. I'm back on my, in the driver's seat, my hands gripped to the steering wheel. But is this, what, is this what Jeremiah's after in this prayer for healing? Is it to surrender? Oh, I think it's more than that. I believe Jeremiah is calling us to a deeper life, a deeper place than we have been. Shall we be so bold as to proclaim that we have all the answers? On the one hand, we don't want to give in on moral issues. On the other hand, we don't want to give our way, away our need to be right, to be superior, to be in control. When I hear those words coming out of my own mouth, I immediately think of original sin. But listen to the words of Thomas Merton. Lord, I don't know if I've ever done your will. All I know is that I want to do your will. I'm not certain I'm pleasing you. All I know is is that I desire to please you. Isn't that what we all desire? To live in God's will, like a tree planted deeply rooted and grounded in God's love. I've told some of you the story of my friend Tom Turner, who lives in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Tom inherited the task of running his father's hardware business. It was not his calling but it was his task, his job that fell to him. 
Tom and I would have long theological conversations about God's will and what God wanted him to do with his life. And Tom would say to me, Bill, if, if I just knew what God's will was for me, I would have no trouble doing it. Well, Tom finally crossed over to the other side of the bridge and he let go of the hardware business and he started doing the thing that he loved and was passionate about, which was coaching and teaching high school students, tennis and soccer. And he gave his life to that. And he had joy and a peace that passes all understanding. To live in God's will is to be like a tree planted by the water, deeply rooted and grounded in God's love. I don't know where you find yourself on the theological continuum right now, but I do believe that we are called to a mystery of transformation. It's a mystery, this life with God in Christ Jesus, who for the sake of all of us walked the way of suffering all the way to the cross. So when we place our lives before the cross, none of us is in charge, none of us is in control, nor was Jesus on the cross, someone else is in control. Someone else is in charge. Someone else understands. After Hurricane Katrina, many of our congregations were no longer in control. Somewhat similar to this season when we can't gather in our buildings, when we're socially distancing, we had to find a way forward. And I give thanks to God for the beautiful way all of our congregations have found a way to be adaptive and nimble in this season of physically distancing, not being in the building, but living and worshiping and connecting in this way. To be sure, we're not in control. Stuff after the storm was, after Hurricane Katrina, stuff was destroyed. Cars were turned upside down. Houses were destroyed. Churches were destroyed. All we had was each other. And in some ways, we're in that same moment right now in this kind of storm we're living in. All we have is each other. Oh, there's a storm brewing. In some ways, it's a storm like we've never seen before. It's a storm we cannot control. But at the end of the day, if we fail to hold on to each other, if we fail to surrender to God, if we fail to be deeply rooted in the deep love of Christ Jesus, we will miss the grand opportunity that lies before us. The question I am living with today is this. How shall we live together? And what shall our witness be? Jeremiah said it this way. Heal us and we shall be healed, save us, and we shall be saved. And then, then, our hearts shall be pure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for that word, Bishop McAlilly. We are so pleased that uh, you brought that to us tonight, and we thank you for your leadership. I hope that you will consider the words that our bishop has just shared about growing deep in God's love, about being rooted in Christ, and, and what it means for us to love one another with the love that God has shown us. Uh, even as we look out on this world and we see division, uh, even as we look at our own denomination, the United Methodist Church, and we see conflict taking place, uh, I pray and I hope that within our families, uh, within the Peace Tree Church family, and here in our community, that we may show others that we are about love, uh, that uh, we would rather be excluded by others for who we include into our family than be included by uh, those who would exclude others, that we would uh, hold up uh, this light on a lampstand and show others what it means to be followers of Jesus, uh, to love unconditionally, uh, to, to welcome all into our midst, and, and to tell them, you belong here. And that the more time you spend with these people in a, a house group Zoom call, with Sunday morning worship, with a Wednesday night online Bible study, the more you will see yourself uh, start to change, start to transform into Christ-likeness, that together we would all become more like Christ, that our behaviors would look more like His, that through imitation uh, we might become 
better disciples so that we can all be ambassadors of God's love and that we might be able to share that hope with the rest of the world. So friends, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you again, Bishop, for sharing those words. We're going to hear a, a special worship song from our praise team. And so we invite you to hear these words. If you know the song, I hope that you'll sing along at home. If you don't, then look at these lyrics as they appear on your screen. Let them be a prayer for you tonight. And uh, after the song, I will end with one last prayer for us uh, before, before we say goodbye. But now let us hear this worship song from our praise team. Many thanks to our worship team for that lovely song and thank you once again for welcoming us into your home in the middle of the week for this special midweek worship service. We will be back uh, to our normally scheduled online Bible study next week on the 15th. Don't forget about this Saturday night's Netflix party featuring Disney's Christopher Robin. Worship with us on Sunday morning from Facebook Live, from YouTube, and from the homepage of our church website, peacetree.church. If we can pray with you this week, then please send us an email at prayer at peacetree.church. Don't forget to say hello to your friends that might be in the chat. It's great being able to see so many people every week join us for our online Bible study. I hope that you'll like and share this video as well so that others would have the opportunity uh, to see what you've experienced tonight. And uh, before we leave, I'd like to offer us a prayer. So will you pray with me? 
Dear God, we thank you so much for uh, this technology, this ability to gather together online in this format. We ask that you would continue to be with us and our families and our loved ones. Keep us safe throughout this week. May we continue to grow deeper and deeper into your love, that we would be rooted in Christ, that we would extend that love out to our neighbors, uh, that we would include others in to the family who do not yet know you, so that, Lord, they would know you, so that they would have a, a sense of belonging, and, uh, and that to Together, we might be stronger and, and be able to share that love and that hope and that message that you have for the world. Be with us throughout this week. Keep us safe. And, and Lord, watch over us until we gather together again. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you. Take care, and we'll see you soon.